All right, so general guidance on assessment planning and implementation. Um, I'll go through a session on assessment. That will be most of the content and then some shorter sections on planning and additional guidance all related to uh, uh, planning and implementing uh, this kind of, of project. And again, to give a general uh, uh, overview on what we're talking about with public health supply chains, quoting uh, uh, Chris Wright here, who works within the, the, the sector, uh, those working public health supply chains view the supply chain as one um, as one among a number of different interdependent systems. And I think that's one important aspect. And then further, the supply chain is focused on delivering medicines and other supplies that enable the health worker to meet a client's or patient's health needs. So that's the overall objective that we're trying to reach with these different interdependent systems. And also relating back to a slide which you saw in Mike Frost's initial presentation when he was starting the, uh, um, the academy on day one, showing this very um, um, broad view of the health information system landscape and how these different systems fit together to serve specific purposes and needs for health services, medicines and supplies, human resources, finances. And that again, uh, this is what's uh, related in the definition in the previous slide that you have these interconnected systems working together to provide health services. And it's really key to understand this interconnection, how they work together and support each other to reach that overall objective. So that's just an introduction to have in mind as we then talk about assessment. Because with assessment and planning, you have to look at the LMIS landscape. You're looking at that perhaps a bit more, more closely. And you want to know how is that structured, which systems are being implemented, for which products or programs at which level what information and the, how is the workflow structured and what the purpose of this implementation will eventually be. So what is the goal that you're trying to reach? Because you'll have different tools. It might be paper-based for periodic reporting. This is oftentimes what you find at the health facilities. It may be Excel or some other locally stored tool, which then is shared uh, uh, when that data is available, or it may be some ELMIS or other uh, um, digital tool that's implemented at one scale or another, and it may, may be well a mix of all of these. It may be implemented, you know, completely at a central medical store. You have your warehouse management system managing your central stores. But at district level, you're only covering maybe part of the sites. It's not every site that is running this ELMIS or other solution. At facility level, even less so. And community health workers, they only have perhaps a pilot running. So this is entirely hypothetical, but this is a situation which you may find. And then for the different programs that are being run, if you may have an immunization program, which has one type of LMIS running to manage all the products. And then you had COVID-19, which was uh, oftentimes came with a lot of funding and had to be implemented quickly uh, due to the urgency of the pandemic. So another solution was, was brought along with it and was supported. For your HIV TB, you may have a bespoke system and it's only used for reporting and not for, for management and decision-making. And then other programs are still using paper or Excel or other tools. So you have this mix of different solutions. And then of course you have the donors, uh, Gavi, Global Fund, UN agencies, USAID and others, including their implementing partners, all working and supporting these different initiatives implemented at different levels with different uh, support. And they also have both ongoing and planned project projects or planned initiatives, which you also need to work to understand. What is it that they're uh, planning to do and what is it that they currently have uh, ongoing? So now to get kind of an overview of what is happening in the country and what you have available, we can then look at the systems that you have in place. So uh, we recommend a tool, and this is again available in the drive, which gives a simple overview over the systems and provides some relevant information. Uh, it should be adapted to your context. If you know that there are certain specific needs, then you can add or remove columns and, and just change this um, and then determine um, if some of the, the needs you're trying to achieve are already there, there may be a system that's already meeting needs uh, for what it is you're trying to, to achieve. So 
you would want to categorize the system, the unit responsible who's actually managing and it has system administration responsibility, who's actually ensuring that this is functioning and users are receiving support, the type of system that is being used and the technology. So if it's an ERP or an ELMIS, if it's an online system or a local system, this kind of information. So really you're cataloging the systems that you have. You also want to know what the primary data sources are. So where is that data coming from? At which level is it being input into the system? Are these paper forms that are being used at a facility sent to a district? And at that point, they're being input into the ELMIS the, the, or, or DHIS2 or, or, or another tool. The reporting flow, again, where is it the data coming from and where is it going? Who is making use of that data? Is it being simply used for reporting or also for decision making? You want to know the data itself, what data is being captured, what type of data, and then information um, on the user. And, and there are some other fields that are not here, and you can add and remove. And with this, you quickly inventorize uh, the different systems that you have available, and you can work towards making a decision about where it is you're trying to go and what you're trying to achieve. Um, another aspect that might be interesting here is to understand what type of indicator and visualizations are you trying to, to, to perhaps create to then inform your users? Because some of these may also be available. If we look at, for example, DHIS2, there are immunization packages. There are malaria, HIV, TB packages that may already have stock data uh, uh, being used in, in the generic packages. These are already included and countries may already be collecting this data. Visualizations and indicators on the amount of stocks issued comparing the to the number of patients that are being treated to make this kind of triangulation, it may already be available for health teams. So when you come in as a uh, supply chain person, an LMIS person, and want to develop certain tools, you want to have access to certain data, you want to make this kind of advanced analysis, it may already be available to a certain extent. Of course, in that case, it would be used for health uh, program management and decision making. But for your purposes, it would be nothing more than having access to a visualization that's already there, the data is available. So it's really also important to catalog this here to ensure that you're not overlapping or uh, doubling up work for something that's already, that may well be available. It's just a question of getting to know that and being aware of what is being used. And then we move on to then a more specific ELMIS assessment, so supply chain and stock assessment. So here you want to know what kind of uh, data is being collected and how is that being used within the supply chain? What's the flow of goods? And then uh, also the flow of information. So uh, goods are moving from a central level down to, to facilities, to service sites where it's being issued uh, and then eventually administered to patients. And then the information is flowing in the opposite direction, informing decision-making or should be flowing in the opposite direction, informing decision-making. And that's what we're trying to, to improve. So understanding the supply chain uh, design and specifically the replenishment systems and methodology would be very key to then uh, propose and use something that will add value to that. And again, the templates for all of these are available on the drive, and you can go through and conduct this kind of um, assessment to know what tools are being used uh, and what scope and how it's currently informing decision making and the supply chain. I know for this, George is really our a uh, true expert. I don't know, George, if you want to add a word or two on this slide. If not, I can continue. Yeah, I can go on to then using DHS2. Um, so now we've promoted this approach. You're using um, certain LMIS tools and you want to improve your systems. You want to digitize facilities. You want to bring this data into the decision-making and into the LMIS sphere, and we're pr promoting and proposing using DHS2. We have this overview here showing uh, a broad uh, implementations, 69 countries using at a national level, as, as we said in the first day, and this is all well and good, and you want to take advantage of that. And now what we want to then show is that we also need to make an assessment, because as you see here, it looks like they're all equal and all the same. However, we need to understand how is that being implemented in your context? And this is part also of the assessments to understand that generally the HMIS teams are the ones 
uh, implementing and running the DHS2 instances in cl with close support from the HISP groups. Um, the normally aggregate data, so report data, is what's being first uh, um, uh, implemented to collect uh, uh, reports and then eventually moving to individual data using the tracker app. And this may be in a separate DHS2 instance, not the same instance. Some stock data may already be available, including uh, indicators and visualizations. As I mentioned before, there may be stock uh, a data module already uh, included with the malaria or HIV TB package or with an immunization package. Some indicators already using that stock data may be available to the health teams. So it's important to understand what they're currently using and what already is there. And then there may also be some, in, some level of integration. Oftentimes it's stock data being sent from the LMIS to DHS2 for the purposes of analysis. But again, knowing how this is being implemented by which teams and what the scope of implementation is, is really key to then start developing and promoting uh, using the same system for um, your LMIS purposes. So get to know the DHS2 core team in your country. This will be the team that's responsible for uh, um, system administration, implementing and support within that country. And now there are some tools and a lot of information on this slide and a lot of things that you can go through uh, on your own about the development of a DHS2 implementation. But I want to focus on what everybody is certainly looking now and it's the house. So there you go, there's this house and the house is a metaphor for a DHS2 implementation. So the house looks nice and, and, and beautiful, and this can be your program, collecting health data and showing these visualizations and these different dashboards, which we saw yesterday with, with Scott. However, the foundation is not necessarily the best. It's standing on some pillars or some pallets, it looks like. And we have to look at what is the quality of this foundation for you to be able to build programs on it. And the LMIS features, this would be an additional program that's sitting on a foundation um, uh, of an LMIS uh, uh, DHS2 implementation. So we have to understand a bit what is the current state of that implementation and how can we best optimize it and use it for the LMIS purpose. So we went from that overall view where we see many implementations in many countries. We want to use it to improve and maximize our supply chain management. We want to digitize facilities and bring that data for decision making and analysis. But what is the current possibility? What is the infrastructure? available for that. So we then have these different assessments for DHS2. These are already completed for many countries. Most countries have already done this type of assessment. First, the readiness assessment when implementing, that's what you see on the left. But then I'm referring more to the maturity profile, which is the one that we'll focus on now. And the maturity profile identifies the quality of the current DHS2 implementation and areas where it's very strong and mature and other areas where it needs further development. It's a questionnaire which has already been completed. We promote that it's shared with partners and donors and that all of those working with DHS2 are aware of the quality of the implementation. So you have a questionnaire where you go through specific areas such as security, administration, metadata, training and user uh, management, using Android and other um, uh, points. And you answer questions and you come up with a evaluation of the quality of the implementation. So you may have a mature implementation where all the needs are met and, and resources are sufficient to, to fulfill those needs. You may have an adequate one, which is good enough, but needs improvement. Early progress where it's only being implemented or not yet achieved, where that may be uh, service or, or is not at all being met. So these are the different levels. And I think it's important to know where it's at for these foundational features. So with that evaluation, it would be applied to programmatic data. So this is individual tracker data for a specific program, malaria, HIV, tracker, or other. So your real-time stock management would be eventually in this column up here. You then have the same programmatic data for aggregate. HMIS data, case-based surveillance, malaria, and eventually your stock reporting option would be in this line here. And this is great. This is what you want. You're uh, using DHS2 for data entry. You're storing this data. It's integrated with the system, and that's all well and good. However, that happens on a set of foundational pieces that need to be in place for those programmatic areas to be properly implemented, including your, your stock 
management features and again, biomedical uh, equipment, life cycle management and all of the others. So these are important points to understand that you need to have facility and population profile to be properly functioning. You need to ensure that the facilities that you have in DHS2, so each health facility and, and that entire health structure is properly organized. Uh, active facilities are captured, new facilities are, are included, older facilities are removed, and this requires consistent management, and that then that list is aligned with the LMIS. When you're sharing data from one site, that it properly matches another site. So you have, here's just zooming in, have a closer look at these foundational pieces, so that when you have data for a site being reported, it's properly matching the same facility data uh, in the ELMIS. For the infrastructure that you have sufficient server capacity, either if it's locally uh, um, um, hosted or if it's on a cloud solution, that you have capacity to run the programs that you're looking to run when you're adding your LMIS program, that they have capacity. That the DHS2 metadata, that over time that's also managed, that you're not simply adding and adding and adding, but all their items are not removed. Uh, so all of these different points are very important. Maybe another one that's really relevant is training end users. What happens when your uh, storekeeper or the person, if it's a health person at a facility who's capturing data, if they lose their password, if their device is damaged and they need some support, if they don't know or remember how to do a certain workflow, who will actually answer their email or pick up the phone or give them support for all of the new persons in the in the health system that are coming and going, you know, people are, are, are leaving their position and new people are, are entering. How are those people trained and supported? So these are all the foundational pieces that ensure that the programmatic, that the features that we uh, show you and, and, and propose can be properly implemented. So it's really important to understand what that level of maturity in the implementation is and how you can work together with the HMIS team, the team responsible for the DHS2 implementation to properly support uh, your initiative. So here you have two very simple examples. Um, on the top, you have a DHS2 maturity assessment that shows a country that needs some more support with some key foundational pieces. And you see that the programs are also suffering in their level of uh, success and implementation due to these foundational pieces. So one idea and one thing to have in mind is that before proposing, we want to have uh, the LMIS uh, uh, features being installed and implemented is that you should also promote and advocate for funding to support some of these foundational pieces. You see that training end users is a key weakness within this implementation. That could be something that could be looked into to say, we can support and we'll uh, identify funding and you you advocate and promote uh, to have this funding from, from different donors or different sources to implement your LMIS solution, but then discuss with the HMIS team and see if you can support some of the needs for this training of end users, that you support the overall capacity and maybe supporting a 50% position that simply works on customer support, uh, that becomes that first line support for any user who has issues with their passwords or access, accessing the system or any kind of workflow challenge that they're available to support LMIS or other uh, program persons. And in that way, you support a existing need. You build capacity in the overall system, which is again, owned and maintained by the country. And then you build that uh, uh, goodwill within the team to implement uh, uh, the LMIS features uh, within the existing instance. In the bottom uh, example, you have a much more developed, maybe a, a longer term implementation where you have a stronger team and you have more capacity. Maybe the infrastructure has been well, um, um, well funded and you have good resources. Uh, training and end users, you may have a very strong team of dedicated persons that they've been there for quite some time. They know the system, they provide trainings for users. And this is great, but you can still help with the one piece which they maybe need some more support. It may be a lot less uh, resources needed, but this would be a lot easier to propose than an implementation to say we have a strong working DHIS2 implementation and we have a strong support team infrastructure and the entire environment is strong. It would not be very uh, problematic to add also the stock data and, and that level of support with the additional users that, that it would take. So really important to understand 
the DHIS2 then landscape and how you can support it and should support it at a foundational level in order to get the goodwill buy-in and cooperation to then implement these DHIS2 LMIS features. The DHIS2 maturity assessment is has been conducted for very many countries, most likely for the country you're in. We've um, um, encouraged all countries to share this widely, to share this with partners. So it should be possible to share with you as well if you're coming from an LMIS team and really get to know that team that's managing and get to understand their challenges and see how you can both make use of the existing infrastructure and, um, and also support areas where they need support. We gave the example of Mali, uh, where there was the integration with the Medexis ELMIS on Monday afternoon. And this was a perfect example where they had a quite mature implementation, a very good team with very good support to his members in country. And the level of effort and the cost were quite, quite low for the amount of input and, and, uh, and, and um, value that they got from the integration. There was some effort done in the actual technical technical integration, but their implementation was much more like the bottom here, where it was quite strong, developed, mature, lots of resources. Connecting that data, which was already available in the system, was very low effort for what the actual outcome was, uh, getting access to this facility level data. All right, I'll go through briefly some quick points on uh, infrastructure for aggregate versus tracker. And again, to remind that, uh, um, Jaime will be following up, speaking specifically about mobile, so I will not go into details of that. Uh, but just to say that for aggregate uh, data entry, um, there will be um, a possibility or, or the requirements would be uh, lower than for the real-time stock tool. So for aggregate reporting, you're reporting on a monthly basis. There's the ability to share devices. There's the ability to uh, um, do this reporting on, on, on a much less frequent basis. It might be uh, once or twice a month that you're actually needing to, to go in and input information, whereas with the real-time stock tool, you're making, uh, uh, you're capturing every transaction. So the availability of a device, uh, maybe having a dedicated device is much more important. So this is something that we need to consider is what is the need for that uh, specific workflow? Do you need a specific device? And in the, specific, in the facilities, do you have multiple people using the same device? Can it be shared? Or do you need to have dedicated devices Keeping in mind that it may be the same person collecting um, health data is also the one issuing in very small facilities where you may have just uh, two or three uh, um, persons working. It, it may be the same person actually inputting that data for multiple uh, programs, including the stocks, all right? Power and connectivity, of course, and this is something that I, I know Jaime will get back to, uh, thinking about uh, especially uh, mobile solutions. Uh, however, we're looking at using mobile for the purposes of, of the offline uh, capacity. The support structure, I mentioned it a few times, who will actually pick up the phone and answer uh, uh, a user who needs uh, pro uh, support, who will actually follow up and ensure that there's capacity within uh, the health staff to use the system and report on the data that you want reported. That's a very key aspect to keep in mind and something that you can definitely support when adding more users to the implementation. Server hosting, this is a, a similar to the other where with aggregate reporting, uh, the, the, the requirement for the system would be much lower, whereas for tracker having transactions, the quantity and frequency of data will be much higher. So these are all um, considerations to take into account. And then mobile data, um, these are the considerations that uh, uh, Jaime will elaborate on with LMIS going mobile. I have these for the purpose of reference here now, but it's yeah, devices, management, inventory, airtime, and so on. And we'll hear a bit more about that soon. For planning, um, just a sor shorter section on that, that once you have this broader assessment, you understand which systems are available, uh, what the workflows and requirements are for your LMIS uh, uh, workflows, what are you trying to improve? You understand then the DHIS2 landscape. So we've gone from systems to then the logistics management to then the DHIS2 implementation and what's possible there, those sort of three broad aspects that I just went through in the assessment. You should then have a clear goal. What is it that you're trying to achieve? What is the scope of what you're trying to achieve with this implementation? 
Oftentimes, you're, you may be starting at, from at the facility, particularly that you have your paper-based uh, management. And perhaps it's good to look at achieving or improving that one step at a time. So going from paper-based to a fully transactional-based system with a full integration, that may be a very ambitious uh, objective. It may be a, a, a fine objective if you have the resources, the buy-in, and the commitment from donors. However, it may be also uh, interesting to simply take that one step to using the uh, aggregate reporting, so the monthly reporting, as a first step introducing users, if not all of them are familiar and already using DHS2, making them familiar with the application, building that connection between teams, and then slowly building up to this uh, uh, broader implementation. So have that goal in mind based on then the landscape and what is possible given that landscape, given the systems that are available to different uh, donors and partners and internal agencies that are implementing, and then the resources and funding available. So just ensure that the goal of what you're trying to achieve is in line with what's possible in terms of resources, commitment, and buy-in from everyone uh, involved. Timeline again, where are you trying to, to be within one year, three years, five years, and so on? Look at this as a long-term uh, engagement and not simply that's something that will be quickly implemented uh, as a one-off. Take it one step at a time. Look at the foundational support, and that again is something that will be over time. User support, uh, uh, for example, the facility management, um, uh, ensuring that all of these pieces are in place will greatly increase your chance of succeeding. Supporting areas which are lacking will improve the likelihood that your specific implementation will succeed. Coordination among uh, internally and also with donors and partners is, is essential that you understand and get to know who those, those responsible persons are. And then of course, the sustainability, again, going back to supporting those foundational pieces will improve um, uh, the sustainability and likelihood of success of the project. Budgeting. Now, this is a very key uh, uh, point. This is from another uh, a slide from a, from a colleague, which I, which I borrowed, uh, that you may be looking at the Petronas Towers, but the budget only allows you to build your uh, uh, baby corn uh, uh, towers. So that needs to match. And that's something that really goes back to setting achievable um, uh, realistic goals with the amount of resources that are available. And here we're talking about budgeting, but it also has to do with, with the buy-in from the different partners involved, that they have uh, people in capacity to implement that, uh, um, that objective. So the funding is also for the one-off uh, sort of implementation, but also having in mind the recurring costs and what that will mean over time. And uh, I think that's a question we can have for Hami as well on the recurring costs specifically for uh, airtime and, and other things related to mobile. All right, so once we have this assessment and planning, we should have then an idea of uh, how we uh, expect to fill the gap uh, that we've identified, keeping in mind that we want to promote this holistic supply chain and product management and avoiding tools that are either siloed or limited uh, in time or scope that cannot be built upon, that cannot be developed for future uh, for future work that we have, even though we may have a very specific objective we're trying to achieve, we can also look beyond that it may be simply implemented for one program with a relatively limited scope. What is the eventual development of that over time? Once you have new projects and new funding with new maybe partners coming in, can we expand this to other programs from uh, immunization to also HIV, TB from district level down to facilities that you have this overall understanding and, and consideration in mind uh, when planning. So for that, we have some uh, a little bit of additional guidance, and I'm already nearing the end of what I want to share with you for today. So for that, it's the interoperability considerations. And for that, you already have it from day one that you're, you have this in the back of your mind. You have it in your, in your mind. Is there a need for interoperability? And we know that with the approach that we're promoting, uh, it's essential to uh, to using DHIS2 as an end-to-end -end solution. It's having that central ELMIS. So we know that it's essential, but in an initial project, you may first want to start with simply capturing data at facilities, and the interoperability or integration would come in a follow-up project in a second project that would look at specifically, uh, again, the system design and reporting forms, the alignment of the master data, which I've mentioned, the facility data, 
and then planning for future workflow requirements. So you'll already have this in the back of your mind. Um, one good example is using the standard uh, data entry form, so not a custom data entry form, so that it doesn't limit the use of mobile in a future implementation. So these kinds of ideas should be there from the start. However, when you're looking more specifically at integration, that, that that should be part of your project as well. Then we also share with you a data source mapping tool. And this is something we developed with our integration team. So Austin, who you heard on Monday, and a few others where we got some more detailed information that can be used uh, to map um, uh, the systems and more specifically information related to an integration. So some of this is partly uh, uh, overlapping with that uh, system inventory uh, tool that, that we shared, but here we want to know uh, in more detail exactly where it's being implemented and how, and that we then go into questions related to the data model. So we need to really ensure that the organizational units um, and the users are the same within the system. So um, if you have, and this is a common thing that we've seen, is that you may have in a country multiple health facilities with a similar name. So we need to ensure that we can properly identify those using um, uh, standard codes so that we know that the two facilities are actually the same one. They may have the same name, but they'll have a unique identifier, a unique code or ID. And this needs to be aligned uh, between the systems. When new um, uh, facilities are opened or closed, that that is updated, again, on both systems. When new users are coming in, that they're trained on how to work within that integrated workflow, and, and that that is possible within both sides, that there's um, uh, both systems are, are working uh, in, in a coordinated way. Ensuring that you know what kind of uh, uh, period of reporting or if it's a transaction-based model, that all of that is properly mapped, that the data elements and here specifically the products uh, being reported are aligned, that you have this uh, central uh, repository for all of the products that are being used in the country. For that, we've referred often to the ELMIS or ERP that would or should have this uh, this master list, should have the, uh, um, uh, this should be the source of truth for, for the data. We've generally used DHS2 as the source of truth for the for the facility profiles or for the organizational unit structure, but that that is understood and aligned between all the systems. Same with the metadata, uh, not necessarily terminology, but that you know that stock issued, stock received, and all of these parameters are, are aligned and are the same so that you're feeding in the right data that's being expected. And then, of course, for the more technical integration, and now we're moving more into the uh, more IT technical, um, a system may say that they have APIs, but that needs to be confirmed at a more specific, more granular level. It doesn't mean that there's APIs for every single piece of information within the system. That's actually system architecture and system development that needs to be built. So simply saying there are APIs is one thing, but there may not be APIs for every single piece of uh, data that you're trying to access from the systems. And it uh, it needs to be identified that for you know stock on hand for every specific facility, maybe it might be some configuration data or some master data that you want to access that may not be immediately available. So here you're trying to identify that um, at the granular level, the workflow you're trying to implement, um, the data will be there and that workflow can be supported. Then we're getting feeding back into then the, uh, the presentation which, which Austin uh, made on Monday connecting this very specific uh, assessment into uh, ensuring that that can be done. And last but not least, system owner. I think that's mentioned a few times, and that's really important to get to know. Um, for DHIS2, it's getting to know the, the HMIS team, the ones implementing um, uh, the system, the ones responsible for the system administration, for the users, ensuring that everything is functioning. Now you're going to have to look at who is responsible for the ELMIS or ERP or any other system when it comes to integration, who's actually responsible for that, because there will be different um, hierarchies, different management uh, responsibilities and different um, uh, accountability structures, different resources coming in to support these, uh, um, uh, these systems, and of course, different donors. So it may slightly increase in complexity. So aligning all of this beyond simply the technical is also quite important. And this data source mapping tool will help with identifying at a granular level the requirements, but then also identifying who the responsible persons should be uh, in working on that integration.
Now we move to Gavi Technical Country Assistance. So the HISP Center at UIO coordinates funding from Gavi to support DHS2 development in 54 countries. So we have this role where we're coordinating the support at a global level. However, countries also have access to country level budgets, so country level financing, which happens or, or you can access outside of this coordinated UIO uh, work. So we might be working on a high level uh, um, engagement. So ensuring that the tools that we've presented here during this academy, the stock management, cold chain equipment management, and so on, this is aligned with Gavi requirements at a very high level. Are they meeting global standards? Are they meeting uh, you know, standards set by different partners and, and UN agencies? Is it aligned with initiatives from other partners that were, and we've mentioned this multiple times, we don't want to be overlapping and developing tools that are already existing in the market. Uh, so that's kind of the global work that we're engaged in. And that's a lot of what George and I are doing is ensuring that what we develop at the core level is uh, relevant and realistic and needed. Now, at the country level, you can then ask for the support to say we want and need, and this is beneficial for our country to implement the aggregate, the you know, monthly stock reporting uh, or the, the cold chain equipment management. So for that, you can apply for funding, which will help uh, to launch a project to do a stakeholder analysis and this entire kind of assessment that I mentioned here, bringing people together around the table. And it's very, very recommended if you can to have these people face to face in the meeting in the same room to talk about what is your system, have them demo the system so you see how it's used, ask them if they can have you know access to, to a kind of sandbox so that you know what's, what's happening. Uh, that you build this buy-in within the different agencies that are implementing these systems, that you have an understanding of uh, uh, what's happening in a country and you have a proper plan to identify a goal. So all of this can, can be uh, done and then having even a limited pilot that you test this in a few sites, 5, 10, or 50, or however many sites that would be possible with the funding available. This would be very possible and is, is a recommended to do through this Gavi funding. So these different ones that I list here are available through this uh, uh, country level grant. So it would be, um, uh, you would need to just contact, uh, uh, if you have a, a Gavi contact for the country, then you can go through them. You can also speak to uh, our colleague uh, Anna Tursang. You have her contact there who coordinates that work and the, these funding mechanisms. And she can put you in contact with the right persons and including the, uh, the local HISP groups that can help you to, um, um, explore and then eventually get to a point where you're uh, launching a, a small project that would be doing the assessment planning and even a limited pilot for any one of these tools um, and then uh, building then buy-in and they would also be I think useful and helpful in that building buy-in from other donors and trying to coordinate these initiatives uh, so that there's funding for a full level scale up because then we get to this more broader donor coordination um, the Gavi funding will not help you, particularly for, 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 for any mid-sized to larger size country, uh, a full-scale implementation. There's a lot of users, a lot of requirements, specifically equipment requirement. So they could also help with coordinating and aligning the donors and initiatives that may be happening in a country with showing that we've done an assessment, we have a project plan, we've done a limited pilot showing that this can work. Now we want support to be able to scale this to you know, from 5% of facilities to 95% to, to of facilities, those with connectivity and, and, and power or, or whatever the objective might be, that you have this uh, alignment uh, with other donors and you're bringing more resources and competence within this DHS2 environment. Different donors can also support different foundational pieces within the DHS2 system and that you promote this holistic uh, supply chain management and, and LMIS approach that we've also been promoting. And that very much has been identified as a challenge that many systems are implemented uh, in, in a siloed way within very specific programs that don't account for uh, parallel systems. So now the donor community is really trying to align behind a one LMIS approach, supporting one holistic solution. That's the, what the, uh, the discussion and the talks now are within the, the donor community. And Gavi very much is pushing for that approach, Global Fund as well. So then through these mechanisms, you can work on the assessment planning and then 
eventual uh, implementation um, of these solutions for your country. Reaching this kind of end-to-end -end supply chain management uh, with the integration, connecting health facilities in the last mile, digitizing all of these workflows and making this data available for decision making and program management. All right, so that was a lot of information and uh, a lot of talking from my side. Um, we have, let's see, yeah, we should go over to um, to Jaime's presentation now on mobile, but I wonder if there's any questions we should take, any immediate questions before we continue. I haven't been able to look at Slack, but if George or Alice, if you if you see that there's any burning questions, we can take it up before moving on. If not, we can go over to you, Jaime. We we have one question uh, from Kose who is asking, will there be any dedicated channel for LMS integration on the COP that can always lean to in case we run into issues while implementing some LMS as a panel integration? Sure, so within the COP we have, um, there's both the supply chain LMIS uh, page or channel, and then there's an integration and interoperability channel. So I think it would be between those two. So I think if you have challenges with, for example, workflows, uh, how you're structuring uh, metadata, how you're aligning data between one system and another, uh, it would be more George, myself, and, and supply chain people looking at that. If you maybe have a more IT technical integration technical challenge, it might be better to take that up in the interoperability or integration. So if a system has limited APIs, or um, I remember Austin presented also the difference between uh, uh, polling for data or notif notifying data with webhooks. So how is the data being um, synchronized between the systems in a sense? Are you asking for data or are you pushing data when you have it? Uh, so that more IT technical can be taken in interoperability or integration, but those two channels, I think, serve already the purpose that, that you will need. So if it's more IT technical, use the integration. If it's more uh, supply chain logistics data, you can use the supply chain page. But we're, we're generally following both. As soon as LMIS is there, somebody will, will ping us and will let us know that there's a question related to our work areas. Uh, this is my question. tough. Sorry, go ahead, Alex. No, please go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so Sean, did you, it might have been answered, would you share with us a maturity questionnaire? I don't know if there's a link in the presentation. Uh, all of these are in the Google Drive. So if you look at the Google Drive, the contents for day five, I've uploaded, uploaded these files. I only showed the header for, for these and the full headers are not there, but you, you can access these. Let us know if you, if you don't find them. I'm reposting the link to the day five folder in the chat. All right, thank you, Alice. And sorry, maybe one, the maturity assessment for your country, we do not have that. So you should, this is what I'm saying, get to know the HMIS team, the ones managing the HIS2, they will have the maturity assessment and we are promoting, supporting, and the donors as well, that they share this broadly. So it's not, it should not be any secret information, but it's the, HMIS teams, the ones managing the HIS2, that will have the maturity profile for your country. And it's been done for some 30, 40 plus countries. So uh, if, if the country hasn't done it yet, you can also let us know, reach out to, to myself, but also to Amma, who I have uh, the contact on the slide. She is working with that as well. And she can also help if uh, your country hasn't done that yet. And we can give you an update of what the plans are to, to, to conduct that. Any more questions or do we move on to Jaime Bosque and Android? I think we can move to the next uh, presentation, yeah. Okay, so over to you, Jaime. All right, thank you much, Vernon. That was interesting. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen because the last time I tried this, I was having some issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This did? Yes. Is it big enough or? Perfect. Now it's big enough, yeah. Okay, uh, the good. thing is I, I don't, I cannot see Zoom. So in case someone is in the waiting uh, room, please uh, kindly uh, make them join because I was doing this while I was presenting, but I cannot do anymore. 
Okay, so good morning, afternoon, evening. I've seen already, I cannot see the chat anymore, but I see some faces or names that I know. So most of the things I'm going to be sharing with you today here, you already know from previous academies or from other events. Uh, this session should last around 45 minutes, probably a bit less because I'd like to have a little bit of time at the end of the session for questions. But basically what I would like to explain or I would try to make you understand is that uh, whenever you decide to put Android in your implementation, in case you already have an implementation and you decide to start using Android, the Android application for your LMIS project, uh, it's not as simple as, okay, I will just buy phones, I will put them into place uh, and everything should work. Well, hopefully it will work, but there are some considerations that you need to plan ahead and you need to understand. So basically these are the three key points that I will try to go over and over again. But basically this presentation should help you identify those main concerns, issues, implications from different perspectives. Uh, how you should plan also in terms of budgeting, etc., and then how you can distribute the application to your devices. Again, this is going to be very general in case, I mean, it's a presentation that sometimes we, we take much longer time to, to do. But uh, in any case, at the end, I will share with you some resources for you to uh, dig a bit further or in case you need to reach us, you know, we are useful in the COP or you can find us via other channels. So before I jump into the growing mobile, the implications, one or, or the key concept that I want to transmit, and I will reiterate to this thing over and over again during the presentation, is that, as I was saying, uh, you might be used to a typical um, client server application where you have laptops or workstations that connect to a server, and they work because the server is properly configured. And you think that doing the same or, or that doing uh, something similar with a phone should have the same results. And this is not the case. And the main thing is because when we develop the Android application, it was developed with the key concept in mind that the application would be used offline. And this means if you're going back to the CML, I have a computer, now I'm giving a presentation to Zoom, I'm connecting to the Zoom server and I'm transmitting uh, in DHS2 or LMIS, if you're using the workstation, laptop, et cetera, should be the same. But with the mobile phone, the thing is that because it was conceived with these offline capabilities, everything is downloaded on the phone and we let you or you are able to work without connectivity to the server. And this is the key concept that has huge implications and the whole presentation is based on that concept, that information is downloaded on the phone and you can operate without connectivity to the phone. Of course, at the initial uh, moment, you need to reach and download information from the server. And at one point when you want to make this information reach in the server, you need to have connectivity. But the fact that I can work offline has all these implications that I will be talking uh, about now. So the first thing is what I've been saying, going mobile means going offline. Um, you could also use the phone, open your browser and connect to the server and operate and work. It's not gonna work maybe, well, for sure it's not gonna work as good as with the application because the application has been specifically developed for this. But in case at one point you will open the browser, for this you will need connectivity, not with the application. Okay, so all the content, the content is gonna be prefetched on the device. So initial thing, you log in with your credentials and Android will put all the information that might need, and this is the key concept, might need and not will need, um, in order to work offline. This means that if you are not setting up properly your DHIS2 and you have been using one user that connects to the server and works, but this user has been not properly assigned the organization units or the programs because they were assigned many more programs, Android application will not know if this user is only gonna be using this program or this program. I say, okay, I'm gonna download everything. And this means that there can be heavy things overloaded if you overload if you have not seen, uh, set up properly, 
etc. So the key concept here, and I'm putting here, is to balance between the metadata access and download what you know that the users will be using on the floor. So if, for example, uh, talking about logistics, you know that this specific worker is only going to be working on data sets, probably you need to set your DHIS2 configuration for not uh, put, giving permissions to this user to use uh, tracker or event programs. Because if not, this will be downloaded by Android. This is uh, basically it. So there are many things where we're listed here, the key ones. And as I was saying, the organization's units capture and search. If there is one worker who's going to be working in this specific uh, facility, there's no need to give other facilities access because what would happen is that Android will download all the lists of facilities that have been assigned to this user. So probably you want to limit the scope. Uh, the same for programs and data sets. If this worker is only going to be putting monthly reports, for example, uh, you don't want to assign weekly reports or you don't want to assign the track of programs, etc. And another thing that might apply in some specific scenarios where you have auto-generated IDs, there is something this is very technical, so I'm not going to list it here. But just for you to know that the application, what it does is asking the server, hey, I'm going offline because I'm Android. So give me X amount of generated IDs. And these generated IDs are calculated on the server, are downloaded by Android. So in case you're using a specific patterns that uh, using, are using dates or sequential, there might have some implications and you might find that afterwards things are not working as expected. Uh, this is listed here in this uh, document. I'm not going to talk about it because it's quite technical, but just for you to know that it will have implications in case you are using auto-generated IDs. Um, yeah. The, yeah, okay. So that was for metadata. So we have set up the server. Some of you I saw here were in the Android Academy, so you know what I'm talking about. Some of you might not be there, but just for you to know, maybe you have uh, set up a DHS2 system. Um, the metadata, we're talking about yeah, data that will allow these users to work. And then the other things we have is data. So we want to be able to work offline because we want to create data or we want to analyze data. And for this, you will need to set up your sync process meaning that you need to, or you can define how much data you want these users to download, not to allow because there's no limit on this, but it's more, do I want my users to have one year of um, historical data on their phones? Do I need them to have only one month because I don't care about the past, they're not doing analysis, they're just inputting? Are they gonna be in very remote areas where there will need not be connectivity? So I want the data to be as little as possible. So these are things that you can define. And I'll show you quickly how you can do it later. But for you, I've been listing here that you could define the number of TIs or the events or data sets. Oh, I don't know how this, or data sets you would like to load. And you have been working or you have been demonstrated during this week about the LMIS basic configuration of the server that was shared. And here on the left, we, we have the tracker and event programs. And here we have the data sets. So what I was saying before, imagine that you have a user who's only gonna be using, uh, putting some biomedical equipment at the lifecycle management. Uh, probably you want to set up your DHIS2 for they, for them not to see these programs because they will not use them are also to not use these data sets. On top of this, you could see that uh, maybe these person here who's going to be using the system, he's going to be going offline for a year because he's going to be traveling to very remote areas and you don't need to receive the information on the server for a year. I'm just making a dumb use case here. But probably then you want this person to be assigned only this program and you need them to have a specific amount of auto IDs in case this person is going to enter, I don't know, uh, 100 devices per month. Okay, so these are things you need to tweak in the system for the application to work according to your needs. Again, we can never give you a specific um, numbers in terms of how you should do because this is a process of thinking how the system will be used. Maybe the same system can be used in different ways by different users. So 
my point here is that I try to give you ideas for you to process and try to come up with a solution that adapts to your needs. And again, maybe this user will be using in this specific way and this one in the other one. So this is something that you need to, to try to come up with a perfect or the best configuration you can find. Apart from this, I was mentioning that this person might go on the field for a year. It's not gonna be the use case, probably this person will be going maybe max of line one week, two weeks. Uh, but another thing that you need to set up is or define a strategy for the, uh, the data syncing process. This means that the users will be collecting information on the field on their Android devices. And at one point, this information needs to leave the device to reach the system. This is uh, a process that can be defined in terms of periodicity. So you could say, okay, I want this to be downloaded uh, or be pushed to the server every day. Uh, most likely for, we have been advised that for an LMIS implementation with one day should be enough. Might be cases where you want this to be manual or you need this to be a specific. So these are things that you can tweak and you can define. And this is something that you can define all this I've been talking about is something that you can define at several level using the other settings web app. This is an application that you can install on your LMIS, the HIS2 server, and you can define all these parameters in terms of how much data I want my users to download, how much metadata, or how which specific metadata I need them to download, and the syncing process up and down for them to do. Okay, uh, I'll give you afterwards in the resources list uh, how to well, investigate much more about this application. Very quickly, because uh, we have a whole session for this in a specific uh, academies, uh, because of what I was saying that the information is not loading on the phone. If I would be working in a workstation and I unplug my server, the information is on my server. Well, maybe I have been, I suffer an attack or something, but the information is on my server, I have, much more control over the server that I would have on our devices. Because on the devices, and as I was saying, the information is downloaded from the server to the device. This means that if I'm collecting sensitive information, I don't think it might be the usual case for logistics, but I don't know, maybe Bruno and George afterwards can come up with a scenario where this could happen. Um, so far, I cannot foresee anything, but just for you to know that the information is on the device. so. Even if the server is unplugged, even if you decide to put security measures on the server because the information is on the phone or the devices, you need to think and define security strategies for this. I will not go into this, um, but it has, yeah, what I'm putting here, it has a huge implication. And probably in case at one point you're dealing with sensitive uh, data privacy or personal information, you might be obliged by the law of your country to perform a specific uh, task or run a specific checks, etc. on this. So again, going mobile, it has a huge impact in many, th in several um, things. And one of the big ones is security. It's not that we don't take this no seriously. And actually we have put into place some risk mitigation measures that I'm listing here. Some of you might already know this one and you might be very, very annoyed because we're not allowing to take screenshots from the phones. This is something that we implemented following specific uh, security guidelines. It's something that you can enable or disable since the last version at server level. But just for you to know that we are doing our work in terms of security, but it's not that because we have done our job, you are, you're free to go. You also should be doing some stuff. And I'm listing here some of the things that you could do. Uh, on the server, you should make sure that you do this. I was saying, for example, uh, make sure that this user who's gonna be working in this specific facility only is able to see this and that. On the devices, you could do this kind of things. For example, uh, asking users to put a pin code on their phones, using the pin code uh, module on the application. And on your implementation, you could decide to use an MDM, which is a mobile device management. That is something I will go quickly uh, afterwards uh, through it. Okay, very roughly because we, we don't have much time, but just for you, key ideas that you can uh, look into further afterwards. 
so that was a bit um, from the implementation perspective. Uh, now let's talk about from the project management. I think Breno has been covering some of these things. Let me go over some others. But basically, uh, well, what I was saying, the same, this and this, but because you are going to make changes maybe on your configuration and your devices are offline already, they have prefetched all the information they might need. Then you realize that your configuration is not ideal. In a normal scenario, normal, not mobile scenario, you will make changes on the server and these changes are reflected immediately on the clients. For example, now I'm doing this uh, slide moving up and down and you're seeing immediately, but if I could be working offline, this will not happen. So you need to make sure that when you have defined a specific configuration, it's the ideal one because making changes might mean that these changes will not reach the clients until much further in time. So one of our recommendations is that before you scale up, you perform what we call the internal testing, the user, the user acceptance test and the piloting phase. So is listed here, we have in the guidelines that I will share you with you later more information about this, but basically it means that start small, make a test, make sure everything is working properly, then go uh, try to reach a broader um, scenario, use case, more people. Let's see if they are comfortable with the, with the application, if they understand how it works, if they're having issues, make the changes you need on the server and eventually go to, to the pilot phase. Once you're sure that this is working properly, scale up to your whole country or your whole project, whatever you're doing. It does not mean that you cannot make changes afterwards, but bear in mind, have in mind that making changes might take very long time to apply because if the users are not connected and are not prefetching these metadata changes, they will not be able to, to see them. So on top of this, maybe on your work plan, you could say, okay, every month I need to make sure my users, or when I make a change on the server, I need to have a way to communicate to my users so they get this new information. Um, in terms of budgets, uh, Bruno has been saying something with you. I'm gonna list some of the key things that we think that uh, apply when going mobile. They are not the only ones, but you can find more and there are some of them that might not apply. But basically, probably you will need to add budgets for human resources because you will need to do more testing, as I was just saying before. The infrastructure, probably your server might need to be tweaked to adapt to a mobile implementation. I will go through this very quickly afterwards. You need to plan in terms of device acquisition and accessories. Before you had a laptop, this laptop probably it's very easy to use by different users. In Android, this is a bit different because you at the moment we have a limitation of three accounts per device. Is this enough for you? If you have five people working on the same device, maybe you need to buy two devices or maybe you need to set different accounts on Android. Um, does the device that we, you, from the implementation team provide is something that we want them to use? Would we allow, would we allow them to use their own devices? This means bring your own device. If yes, can we ensure, because of the security things that I will mention before, can I ensure that these people using um, their devices are going to comply with my security policies? Yes, no. So these are things that you need to think from the very first moment because they will probably have a big impact on your budgeting. If at one point you think that you're gonna have 100 people working there and you think 100 devices might be enough, you might plan, but maybe you can say, okay, listen, I might ask them to use their own device. This, I have seen that it works in some projects. So maybe this is something that you don't need to budget or maybe yes, or maybe you need to budget for this plus other things as we will see now with the recording cost, et cetera, et cetera. Another key concept is the connectivity. As I was saying, Android is made to be working offline, but you need to have internet at the beginning for sure to download this metadata and eventually data, and then you will need connectivity to push this information back to the server. This might mean working on Wi-Fi, but might uh, mean working via uh, 4G, 3G, whatever you have available in your country or place where you are. And also the mobile device management. 
that I will talk briefly about afterwards. Uh, on top of this, it's not that you only have budget lines that you define once and then you forget about it, it's that you are gonna have recurring costs. And I will not go through them, but just for you to know, for example, for connectivity, if you are going to have or deploy a project who's gonna last for two years and you are working on uh, mobile data, you need to know that these phones, devices, tablets, whatever, will need internet connectivity for two years. So this means having data bundles or having subscriptions, etc. So are recurring costs that you need to take into account and do not forget when, plan when planning or budgeting your, your project. That was project management decisions. I'm gonna start with the last section of the, of the presentation, which is related to infrastructure uh, decisions. I have divided this section in two. Uh, first, we're gonna be talking about uh, from the mobile perspective. So devices like, like uh, telephone, tablets, etc. And the last one is gonna be about the server. Again, a bit technical, but just for you to collect some key concepts that afterwards you can go and discuss with uh, project managers, uh, technical people, if you're not, etc. So from the mobile perspective, uh, at one point, what we need is to make sure people have their uh, DHIS2 or LMIS application or their phones. I'm having here the tablet. Um, I'll, I'll show you eventually, um, but well, as we need this application to be installed, again, I'm going back to the explanation from the beginning, uh, DHIS2 works usually on the web browser. So if you have not been using Android, you know that you can type whatever your country slash DHIS2 and it brings you to, to the website. Uh, um, so this, well, it's a web application, let's say, even though you don't have to install anything, but you access via the browser. In the Android application, you need to download this application and there are several ways to download it. I'm covering here this one and this one. So other channels and the main one that people use, which is Google Play Store. If you, had one, if you open your Android devices now and you search for DHIS2 Capture, you're gonna bring to this um, probably page, I don't know how to say, uh, screen, where you can install the application. And in order to install this application, you need to have a Google account or devices. So this is something that you need to plan from the beginning. Okay, I'm going to distribute and I'm gonna put a specific example. I have an implementation logistics. I have 40 facilities. I have 40 devices. So one device per facility. Do I want to have 40 different Google accounts or do I want to use LMIS my project at uh, google.com or yeah, for example, or at Gmail or whatever. Uh, Google account you have. These are things that you need to decide. And um, distributing the application via this is quite simple because then you can just open the Play Store, install it, and that's it. Even though if you do this, you will have zero control over the updates. This means that when we put a new release out there, it will happen in the next uh, two weeks, probably. If your devices have not been set up to disable the automatic updates, you will receive new updates. And this might be, I mean, it's good from the security perspective because it makes, uh, it means that we have updated and we have include some security patches in case there were some security issues, but also we have include new functionalities. And this means that if your users have not been trained on the new functionalities, they might find a new application and they might get lost. So in case you are using Google Play Store to distribute the Android application, make sure that you disable the automatic updates, or if you don't, because maybe you say, okay, we want to be always to the latest. Make sure you understand there are consequences and you should probably test or have a team of testers, <coughs> excuse me, that can uh, quickly produce documentation according to this, or they can follow our development. They can even be in the beta release and they can be ready for when this happens to talk to their users and make sure they know how, how the new changes affect their mobile phone, for example. There are other channels to distribute that I will not cover because they are a bit more difficult to manage, but just for you to know that if you are not happy with the Google Play Store distribution, you could put your own market, for example, you could 
uh, install or deploy an MDM and you could distribute the specific version that you want whenever you want. Okay, it's here. And again, I have more information about them in the last slide. I've mentioned several times during the presentation, mobile device management, so MDM. Sometimes I will mix these terms. It's exactly the same, MDM. And basically, just for you to know that an MDM is a specific security software that you install somewhere, and then you can apply policies to your mobile devices. Okay, basically that's the name. So in case you are deploying or you have a huge project with a lot of devices and you think that going manually to perform certain uh, tasks on these devices is something that you cannot afford because there are too many or because they are very remote. At one point, you could consider having a MDM. and means that in the central console, you will define policies and these policies are installed in the devices. At one point before I was mentioning, um, bring your own devices. So it's another thing that you need to think about. If I'm having an MDM to manage my devices, can I impose people who are using their devices to use my MDM policies? Maybe yes, maybe not. Something that you need to, to think about it. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, but yeah, so a, a example, for example, for the MDM, trying to be more um, specific. Imagine that you're dealing with sensitive information. Again, I don't know if this can happen. Maybe yes, instead of a stock management or, or vaccines somewhere where you think they, I don't know, might get stolen. So you need to make sure that this information remains um, secure on the phone. You might impose a security policy on your phone saying, okay, I can remotely wipe the phone. The phone. So if the, at one point, the user notifies me, hey, my phone has got stolen. I could remotely wipe it. You could also impose a policy that say, okay, all my phones that are gonna be using this application, they need to have a very strong passcode in order to open the, uh, unlock the screen, for example. Just key things that uh, you could uh, implement with the MDM. We have a full guideline of uh, how to use MDM. So in case you want, it's gonna be also on the last slide. I was saying these are some examples of things that you could do. Another thing that might be interesting for you is that uh, restricting access. So imagine you are in an implementation where mobile data is very expensive. I don't know, you're in a country where mobile data is very expensive. And you know that some users are using the device that you have provided to work on the logistics application. They are using to serve the web, Facebook, etc. So with an MDM, you could block these accesses. So people will use the phones or the devices specifically only for what they are meant to be used. For example, okay? Things that you can do with an MDM. And here there's a full guideline that you can see afterwards and probably can help you with this. I'm close to the end. So this is the last uh, slides or set of well, section of the slides. And it's gonna be about infrastructure related decisions in terms of the server. So I've been talking about things that you need to think about while deploying from the mobile tablets uh, perspective. Now let's go back to the server. Um, so at the beginning of the presentation, I talk about configuration of the DHS2. I'm not going now into that. I'm going now really to the to the hardware of the server. So the specifications, the technical specifications of the server, not the configuration. We can forget about the logistic application. I'm talking really, really about the server. I'm gonna make here a very quick comparison, trying to, you to, to see why this, have, this could have an impact. Imagine that we have an office where we have uh, 30 users sorry, 10 users and 10 users are bringing one letter per day. So we have one person working on the post office and every day that person has to receive 10 letters because there are 10 users and one letter per day. So probably it's something that he or she can handle, 10 letters per day, I could handle that, not much work. Now imagine that these users decide not to come every day because they are going in very remote areas but they write a letter per day. So at the end of the month, 10 users, they're gonna bring 30 letters. So we have had 
a person working on the post office for 29 days doing nothing. Let's see, I'm not going to go into this. I mean, probably he or she is doing a lot of things, but not doing anything with letters. And now they are receiving uh, 30 letters, so 300 letters. So this person, the users, 30 letters on the last day of the month, they will have a lot of work. So this is something which is similar to what could happen with Android. When you're using with your workstation, with your laptop, you enter a new um, a stock management um, numbers. You say, okay, I have this and this and this. You send it to the server immediately. With Android, what happens is that you're putting everything in your phone. So I'm registering here everything, blah, 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 blah. And then when I'm synchronizing, I'm going to send all this information. So the server is going to receive a huge amount of data in a very short period of time. If it's only me, it's fine. But if we have a thousand devices doing the same, it might have a huge implication on the server because it will receive a huge peak of load. And it, it needs to be able to handle that. Um, I was saying before that you can define via the Android settings web app how often you want this to happen. Probably, as I was so discussing with Bruno, once per day should work, but maybe some users will not be able to reach internet uh, daily, or if they do, maybe we need to make sure they synchronize at different times because of this, okay? So it's not that um, the size of the requests are gonna be bigger, yes, because I'm not gonna be sending one change in the stock management. I'm gonna send everything that I have recorded at the same time, so a huge load compared to what is happening in the workstation that is a little one. And also, if I have several users doing this at the same time, it's big and it's going to multiply for every user doing this at the same time, okay? So maybe you think that your server has been working very well with, uh, I'm going to make numbers, 100 users using their laptops. And you say, okay, now these people are going to be using phones, so I, didn't, I don't need to do anything on the server. Well, probably yes, because of what I have explained. This is the last slide of the presentation. So I hope it has been clear. I know I've been, talk a bit, I've been talking a bit fast. Uh, at least I thought, I think I, I managed to transfer the key concepts. If not, a very quick, quick up. Going mobile, it's gonna have a very big impact on your logistics, DHIS2, LMIS implementation. And we have put this into four groups. Maybe they can they can be split in more, but the big one uh, here is the configuration. As I was saying, you need to tweak your configuration to define a specific, and you can probably not use the same configuration that you are using when you're using laptops or desktops. From your project management, it's gonna have a huge impact because it's gonna impact how you do troubleshooting, how you train your users, and how you budget your, your project. In terms of security, we saw it has a huge impact because the data is not longer on one specific place, but in many, many more, one per device. And in the infrastructure, because uh, we have many more devices to handle, we need to distribute an application on those devices. And my server might suffer from all these uh, heavy loads that might reach eventually when users perform their synchronization. That's pretty much it. This I have put here, and I think this this uh, slides you already have access because they have been shared in the drive. I have added here some of the key official guidelines that we have written. You can also find us in the COP. I know some of you uh, already from the COP or from previous things, so you already know that we are quite active there. So in case you have questions, you can always come back to us. I haven't listed here GDAN or anything, but uh, eventually if you have a problem, I will refer to, to it um, from the COP. That's it for my presentation. I don't know if you have questions. I'm gonna stop uh, sharing my screen so I can see your questions in the chat or in Slack. Yeah. But, Hi, uh, me. Yes. Yeah, actually there's quite a few questions, a lot of activity. I think a lot of interest on your presentation. So big thank you for, your, uh, for all the inputs. Uh, yep. The recording will be available on YouTube as well. So I know you gave a lot of information in a short time, but they can refer yep. back to it. But I want to pick out two key questions that I think it's good if you answer in plenary. Sure. One is from Kolse Bilali. He's in South Sudan. He writes, the download is really a headache, especially with the tracker, and sometimes it overloads device capacity. 
We faced an issue where we have thousands of data that needed to be downloaded. This is because before a data entry, data entry officer needs to first search the TI to see if the data is already entered. And this was for COVID-19 um, uh, vaccination and surveillance. And this may be very specific, but if you can give a general feedback on that. And the second question is from Nora, who says there is never enough time to do proper testing. So if you can comment on that as well from your experience. Yeah, one second. Um, so for the first one, uh, in terms of uh, having to search, etc. Let me. I'm putting it here so I. All right. So let me go back to this. Um, okay. So Bil what's the name? Bilal. I don't know what's your name. Sorry, the guy from Sudan. Well, I didn't see. It doesn't matter. Um, so you were saying that uh, Android requires you to search before entering. This is true. The reason it was made, uh, this decision was taken, it's because in order to avoid duplicates, and this is kind of a headache the way it's implemented now. So I'm gonna try to be more specific. I have two devices. These devices has entered my data, COVID data, and has not synchronized. And then this other device comes to me and reads the same data same user and we are using the unique identifier, which is the my national ID. So this one is gonna synchronize to the server, the first one. So when this one tries to synchronize, it's gonna say, hey, you are trying to put a person in the system that is already there, okay? So uh, in this specific case, there's nothing you can do because this one did not synchronize, this one did not synchronize. The first one that synchronized is the one that had the authority to write into the system. Uh, in a good or in the best setup that we could thought is like, okay, I'm talking about COVID in this specific case. We know that patients might come daily, for example, to different facilities. So I'm going to set up my uh, synchronization process as I'm showing here daily. This means that this patient, sorry, this health worker registers me, goes back to the system. And now I'm going to a new facility. I'm going as high to the facility and say, this is my national ID number. I have to search before. So this phone will search in the system and will say, ah, okay, no, I'm not gonna let you put Jaime in the system because it's already there. So this is the record of Jaime. In case you need to update the information, update this, but you cannot create a new Jaime because Jaime is already there. This is in case you're using unique identifiers because if you are using patients with uh, not uniqueness limitations, this could not happen. But this is why Android was developed and forces you to perform this search before um, entering data. We know sometimes it's cumbersome. Actually, at the beginning, it was all like this. And then people requested in the field, hey, no, no, no. we're having too many duplicates. You need to put this back. So it's a very difficult thing to handle because, again, we are developing an application that can be used in huge number of scenarios. So it's very, very difficult to try to adequate. So far, we have found that having this search before it works. If you would not want this to happen, what you can do is being offline. If you have your um, uh, airplane mode activated on your phone because the phone cannot record, you could register the, the person in the system, but when you synchronize, you will suffer this. Uh, and you were also mentioning that uh, downloading data might be too much, of course, and that's the reason we are recommending everyone to use the Android settings web app. Because with the Android settings web app, and it's here, yeah, well here, what you could do is you could define and you could say, okay, I'm going to be in a scenario where these two health workers are going to uh, go to very remote areas and they don't have very good internet connectivity and they're only going to be entering patient data. They don't need to go through all data because we're just vaccinating uh, with one shot vaccine making a scenario here health that I know a bit more. So you could set up your uh, server to say, okay, this phone and this phone, or in general, this user, the vaccinator user will not download any data. So you could go here, I'm going now to the presentation and you could say, uh, okay, I think this is not a problem. This is um, number of TIs to download. You could say, okay, download zero TIs. So this means that I will only make a very quick synchronization at the beginning. I will download all the metadata, but I will not take time to download more data because there's nothing that I want to load because I have told my server not to download any piece of data. 
I don't know if I answered your question. I hope yes. Otherwise, I can come back to it in Slack because I think we're running out of time. Uh, or if I have time, if they let me continue, I will continue. The second question was for Nora saying, uh, proper testing, there's never time. Of course, I know. <laughs> Actually, we're going to release the new, the new version in two weeks and we're already testing. Um, already or still testing, better said. Uh, we know the thing is that, and I know you know this, but I need to, to tell you is that sometimes if you do not allocate time in testing, it will have a worse impact later on. Because if you have not tested properly, then you will find problems and then you will need to make changes on your DHIS2 configuration. And then you will need to ask these people to come back to synchronize, or you will need to suffer on performance changes on the database because what these users have input already in the system is not correct. So I know that I'm telling you something that is not new to any of you. I'm just trying to tell you that if you do not test, you might regret it. And that's the reason here, from the project management, we're telling you, make sure that from the project management, project management perspective, you allocate resources like human resources, monetary resources, and time resources for this testing to happen. Again, if you don't do it, I mean, I mean I'm gonna tell you, uh, when you come for support, if this happened, I know that oh, you should have done testing. Well, I might say it, but I saw that I will not help you, but if you perform or if you try to foresee uh, what you might need. So if you do a proper testing and you follow these things that we recommend to use, probably you will be much more uh, likely to succeed in your implementation. I don't know, Nora, if I answer your question, maybe you didn't want to hear me saying that, but uh, is the way I see it. Yes, um, testing and the time and the resources to testing is always a challenge and you are always chasing yourself I, I know but i know i mean in the end this is uh yes uh, personal experience here i'm part of the security team in dhis2 uh, i used to work in another company we had always the same it was like i'm always going there and say hey i need money for security and they tell me my bosses were always telling me nah it's okay everything is working fine and yes but the problem is that whenever a problem arises Rises is like, ah, oh, shit, I should have invested. I shouldn't have said shit because it's been recorded. Ah, oh, damn. Um, I should have invested more in this because now I have to spend more money or now I my data has been stolen. So I know it's difficult uh, with this information I'm, I'm giving you here. Maybe, maybe you will be more likely to convince your boss saying, okay, listen, they've told me that if we don't do this, in the future, we will need to spend more money. And if their only problem is money, maybe you convince them. If, uh, for example, with COVID, so two years ago, we understood that people did not have enough time for testing. So uh, in the end, it's a balance that you have to play with and say, I, I don't have time. I have money, I don't have time, let's go. I have money, I have time, okay, I do testing. I'm not getting anything, okay, I go, and then I will regret it. But that's a bit, uh, I know it's, it's impossible to have a, a good answer, but uh, that's what I try to advocate sometimes. All right, I know we're a bit over time on the break, but I think there's one more question, Jaime, if I can ask you to answer, and it's from sure. Mohammed Omar. He writes in the Zoom chat, where can I find the data in the mobile device? I mean, the storage data file for Android using DHS2 app. And Mohammed, you can also speak up if you want to uh, clarify any of that. Um, yeah, Mohammed, I don't know if, I mean, um, I'm gonna show you something quickly. Because I don't know specifically why, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, and I'm not gonna be shame. I'm gonna do it like uh, old school, like showing the screen like this, instead of putting it through the computer, just to show you one thing. Um, okay, so this is my, that's my other phone starting up. Okay, uh, uh, this is some information I have on my phone. And if I go here, uh, let's see, ba -ba. settings. So I don't know if you can see, otherwise I'm gonna share my screen. So here I have gone to settings and here there is one thing that I can say delete data. So if I could click delete local data, uh, the phone is gonna tell me, are you sure you want to delete local data? Uh, 
so this is the information that is on the phone. You cannot, and that's one of the security measures we have implemented, you cannot connect a cable. So imagine I've lost my device, my tablet that contains sensitive information. Uh, if you take a cable, you cannot pull the information from the device because we rely on Android as a safe or secure operative system. Even if I steal this tablet from you, I will not be able to pull the data from there. It doesn't mean I cannot delete it. I show you how to delete it, but this is from inside the application. But I could also go like this. I'm gonna show you. So I'm gonna click here, this is a training application. If I click it here for a little bit, it's gonna pop up something. I can go to application information. And there, there is something called storage. I think it's up there. And here you could see that says clear storage, clear data. If I clear data, that is what I'm gonna do. I know clear storage, clear cache. So clear storage is gonna ask me, are you sure you want to delete this? If I click okay, I think I click it. Now I've completely deleted all the information. So now when I go back to the HIS2, you will see that actually it brings me to the login screen because all the information has been deleted. So your question was, where can I find the data of this? The data is stored safely or securely, better said, on, in your device via the Android storing mechanism that ensures that this information cannot be taken away via means like this or this. But you can still delete it and you can use the Android uh, operative system app management settings to delete it. I don't know if that answered your question, Mohammed. Maybe you want to clarify if I did not. Please stop sharing so I can see the chat. I'm still thinking. Uh, that was good, Jaime. Thank you. And I wonder if maybe Kose Bilal, you can ask the last question before we go to break. Yes, hello. So I wanted to just follow up on the issue of the downloading a lot of data. Like, for instance, when you're having the two vaccinations, so like three phase vaccinations. So, in that scenario, we needed to download all the data from the first vaccination to, in order to search whether the person has already been around to the first vaccine. Yeah. Then from there, we can enter the other one. So, I'm just curious whether there's some optimization that can be done in that process to reduce the device capacity from being overloaded. Thank you. Okay. So for me, I mean, not knowing how you told me Sudan, right? You're in Sudan. South Sudan. South Sudan. Okay. Sorry. Um, I don't know how how connectivity is in South Sudan. Um, I was not far from there a while ago, and there was uh, connectivity, quite decent connectivity, uh, via mobile, pretty much everywhere. But maybe in your facilities, hospitals or health facilities, you have a um, good Wi-Fi connection, let's say, and then you have internet via well, whatever, um, um, 3G, well, whatever, you have connectivity. So my recommendation in this setup, in order to be able to work as quickly as possible, I mean, I have not studied the case, but what I would probably do is I would go to my settings of the server and I would make sure people are downloading zero TIs. Because if I put my, my phone, my device setting up in the server to download zero TIs, because of the imposition of Android to search before, uh, my initial configuration will be very fast because there's nothing I need to download, just metadata, and this metadata only is downloaded when it changes. So first time, let's say it takes two minutes, then next time, every time I open the phone, it's gonna search for metadata no changes, so zero things to download because I have set to zero TIs to download, nothing is allowed. So I can immediately start working. So now the patient arrives, me, Jaime, I want to take a vaccine. I arrive there, Android imposes searching before. So they're gonna search Jaime Bosque, national ID, this one. Then this triggers a search to the server. Uh, the server finds and it tells me, okay, have found Jaime Bosque. Do you want to load? You click on download and you're only going to be downloading me as a TI. You work on me, you put my new shot. Uh, today, 14th of October, I got Pfizer vaccination. Bah, and then you click on synchronize or you have automatic synchronization. So it goes up to the server. This is in case you have internet. 
if you don't have internet, this that I just told you will not work because uh, you are relying on being able to search for the system. If you don't have internet, unfortunately, you need to download the patients beforehand. So the first synchronization is gonna take a lot because you say, okay, um, I'm gonna have to deal with patients that have only been in this organization unit. They always come to the same facility. Well, then I could trick my system for my users to only download uh, uh, patients from this health facility. I could trick that. So then I will already reuse the data. The problem is if that patients are coming to this health facility to take the first shot, but then they are going to this one, I need to make sure that my phones are set up to download these patients and these patients. And this again, it's data that in the end you need to download and there's nothing we can do because the data needs to be downloaded on the, on the device to, to work. So again, it's very difficult for me to, to provide a specific answer. For me, what I would try to do is this analysis I have very quickly done and see how could I trick do I have internet? Yes, then I reduce my data load at the beginning. I do not have internet, then I'm gonna to try to limit as much as possible the scope in terms of organization units. I don't know if I helped you there. All right, great. Thank you, Jaime. Thank you to um, the participants. This was really a lot of good input and a lot of good feedback. Um, we've been, as I mentioned, throughout the whole week, lots of engagement on the topic. So this is just continued. I know we've gone way over time, uh, but I think it's useful to make use of Jaime's uh, expertise. So I, I didn't want to cut off early and not have access to all this great uh, feedback. I know there's a comment from George in one of the channels that this uh, data overload and TEI overload is not necessarily applicable to the logistics use case. You're not registering new patients uh, um, because the product list is, is more or less set. So this is something that I think is less, uh, um, I mean, these use cases, of course, are for COVID uh, uh, vaccine delivery and surveillance. So for, for the logistics, this specific issue may not necessarily be a problem, but I think the overall um, uh, considerations and especially the testing, because there can, of course, be other things that uh, don't come up in the in a health case that will come up in a logistics case. So I think the testing and learning is really important there. Um, there are a few more questions, Jaime. If you have the time and patience to answer in Slack, I didn't want to take everything up here. We could be here for uh, the entire day because there's so many questions and so much engagement. But we can try to answer a few of those on Slack. Uh, what I had mentioned is that I would uh, try to to summarize that and maybe share all of this feedback and these questions in a consolidated way after the academy as well. Uh, but what we'll do now is we'll we'll go to break. Um, we'll come back at in 15 minutes, or we can say 17 minutes. So we can come back at 12 Oslo time, and then we can continue with the Mentimeter recap and just closing words and closing statements for the academy. All right. So we'll meet back here in exactly 17 minutes, now 16 minutes at 12 um, Oslo time. All right. Big thank you again to Jaime and see you guys in a few Absolutely. minutes. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Cheers. See you.